It's fair to say we always hear the term disruption, and disruption is a pretty common term we're hearing buzzing around. And people say, what does that actually mean for us as an organisation? What does it mean for accountants? Well, this might not come as a surprise, but compliance work is drying up. Now, it's not drying up necessarily at the rate that some people suggest it is, but it is changing. And I don't need to tell you that if you're in practice. You know that the demands your clients are placing on you uh, are becoming very different. They're expecting more from you, arguably for less. How many people have been through the shopping centre on a Sunday afternoon and been stopped by a client uh, to say, oh, by the way, I just meant to mention this during our, during our meeting and appointment, and then are surprised when you send them an invoice for it. Um, the, the fact is clients expect that level of service from you beyond the compliance-based activity. And so our challenge as an organisation is how are we helping members to position for that change and that disruption? Technology has changed significantly. Uh, who would have thought that the impact Uber has had on the taxi industry? Who would have thought the way that realestate.com.au has changed the way people sell property? In fact, now real estate agents are saying, where will we be in a couple of years' time? The direct sales, you know, the growth in real estate uh, websites for people to directly sell their property away from uh, the 3% commission rates that real estate agents charge. So things are changing. The way we live our lives is changing. Um, and it was remiss of me before I, uh, before I started because, um, as, as Andrew Colwain mentioned, um, hashtag IPANC15, I better just take a photo to put it up on Twitter. Uh, so give me a wave. Um, Beautiful, there we go. So I'll, I'll put that up on Twitter. But w business is changing. So the way we're engaging on Twitter, uh, the commercialisation of Twitter, of Facebook, people starting businesses, <coughs> excuse me, on Facebook, uh, being able to run online stores. My, my wife the other night was clicking away on Facebook and buying product and, and she said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm at a uh, virtual Tupperware party. What the hell is that? I mean, it's a, a virtual Tupperware party. And so she's on Facebook buying Tupperware. I said, so how does that work? The next day, this stuff arrived. Um, I didn't realise how much Tupperware a person actually needs, but, you know, I, I can't find a thing in our pantry. There's stuff that's just sorted. And I go and I say, I just want some oats. And I said, I need a catalogue index. Um, but, but the way which we're living in engaging commerce has changed dramatically. So what are we doing about that? What are you doing about that? And so our challenge and, and is to members, and I implore you really to think about the, the, the impact that technology is having on your practice, the way your clients are interacting, and what you can do to leverage that. Our challenge is how do we resource that for you, and what do we do to help you out? So the technological advances have been and continue to be profound. But I want to talk now about the critical role that accountants play. And, uh, we talk a little bit about this, but I think it's, it's a really important factor to think broadly about or more about how do we impact the community in which we live. We can talk about helping people with their tax returns, we can talk about adding, you know, doing the value add services to clients, but what's the overall end goal of what we do as a profession? And it's true to say that Australian accountants are amongst the most trusted advisors in the world. Our, the research we undertook through our white paper process indicated that nine out of 10 uh, businesses will go to an accountant for advice before anyone else. Now in the UK, for example, that's uh, four out of 10. And that, that is still top of the tree in the UK. So accountants are also the trusted advisor in the UK. But nine out of 10 Australian businesses go to their accountant for advice before their banker, before the lawyer, dare I say before government. I don't know how many small businesses just knock on the door of the ATO saying, don't know if I'm compliant, but you know, can you help me out? So people don't do that. People don't trust the government to give advice. They trust their account. They trust you to give that advice. And so we've got to respect that trust relationship. Because the work that we do in their profession helps to build businesses. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to talk about the work we're doing in, to build businesses, which then help to build economies, and those economies fundamentally sustain our existence. The world without accountants doesn't happen. Every transaction has an accountant at either side of the equation. In the most impoverished nations, one of the critical reasons why they struggle to rise above the poverty levels is because, is because of a lack of financial transparency. You build financial transparency by boosting the capacity and capability of the accounting profession. And so we see in our market, that you know, the work that we do in the profession has a direct social impact on the people we, we work with. So I think we're going to be we have to start thinking more broadly about what is it that we do 
and, and the impact that we have on the communities we work in. I don't have to tell you this, but, but accountants become part of a small business family. I mean, you, I was mentioned about walking through the Sunday shopping centre and being stopped. Um, you, you are, I'm, I'm sure, how many of you feel as though you're part of many of your clients' families? You sort of, you might be invited across, to, to christenings or to, to family functions and to birthdays and celebrations. It's the way the accountant play, the impact that you have on those people, which means you're becoming included in that sort of family context. You contribute directly to the success of small business. I think anyone who wants to question that link between your role and the, and the value and growth of small business uh, doesn't legitimately understand the functioning of the profession. But it's, it is uh, a concern that life as a small business owner is really tough. I know in my brother's case, my twin brother's case, there's another clue for you, my twin brother's case, he runs a landscaping business in the Southern Highlands in New South Wales. Um, he's uh, supported his uh, wife, my sister-in-law, through her third bout of uh, breast cancer. He comes home every day with two young uh, daughters uh, and has to uh, go through the bass, uh, does his paperwork. And he just said to me recently, I struggle. And if I showed you a photo of my brother Mick, um, he's got a really big bushy beard. Um, uh, and uh, I said, yeah, I can see you struggle, mate, because you can't even shave. Um, <laughs> but, but he just said, uh, he said, it's just so tough. It's really tough. And he's running a successful small business. But the stresses that that places on him and on his family and on the rest of the broader family uh, is felt directly. And so we know that the, the life as a small business owner can be really tough. And there's actually been some research about that. And Professor Angela Martin from the University of Tasmania has actually done some really groundbreaking research to indicate the impact of small business stress on small business owners. And there's actually a direct correlation. It shows that, that, that these characteristics here of stress, you know, uncertainty, the responsibilities that are being juggled, the sense of isolation, there being no downtime, you can't just take leave as a small business owner. Um, there's very little work-life balance for the, uh, for the small business owner and manager. Uh, and, and ultimately, the, the risk of business failure has a direct social consequence. And that social consequence is there are markedly higher rates of suicide of small business owners in Australia. So the risk of depression, the, the fear of failure is profound. So when you think about what the role accountants play, what is the role that the accountant plays in that context? There is a direct link to the fact that accountants have a direct correlation to lowering rates of depression and stress in small business. So again, the impact you have, whether you realise it or not, is having a direct uh, life impact on the people you're interacting with. Again, I just want to put that in context because we sometimes lose sight of the direct impact you have. But there are significant contributions that are made on an everyday basis. And I think in many ways we, are, um, we don't do enough of celebrating the success in the work that, it, that uh, accountants do to drive small business success. Uh, but in, in that sense, very much the unsung uh, heroes uh, in, in Australia. And to give you an example, that in 2009 we uh, issued a a plea to members to be involved in a pro bono register to help the victims of the Black Saturday bushfires. Um, and that was after the uh, huge human toll that was taken. Uh, the months and the years that followed resulted in a huge economic toll because small businesses that were devastated would just turn up uh, when the smoke had gone to the pile of ash where the business once stood and just threw the keys on the pile and walked away. And that had a huge economic ripple effect across the economy. Uh, particularly in Victoria. And so the, 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 we had more than a, almost 200 uh, members volunteer their services to assist those small businesses on a pro bono basis. And I think it's yet another example of what can be done by the profession. We then uh, mirrored that in uh, Queensland and in New South Wales for the flood victims. And I was stopped the other day by a couple of members who talked about the, uh, the three of obviously bushfires in Australia and the fact that as we speak, 100 kilometres north of Esperance, there are uh, raging bushfires in WA. Uh, four people have been uh, killed and uh, there have been countless homes and livestock lost. And so on your behalf, on behalf of the Congress, I know we have a particular theme on Saturday night, but the IPA on your behalf will be making a donation to the country fire authorities and the rural fire services uh, as we go into the bushfire season, uh, just to indicate the fact that we, uh, we are supportive. There are members here today at this Congress who have been directly affected by that. So in that, in that vein, we'll be making that uh, donation. Um, so the, the pro bono register has been a, a great 
uh, of great importance for the organisation. And, and I think also for the profession. So let's now talk about the economic importance of small business. And as, uh, as Andrew pointed out in his introduction, we've, we've actually uh, published the small business white paper. So how many people have downloaded it or had a look? Yep, that's great. So this is available on our website. There might be a few copies floating around. Um, and if you want to have a, uh, a, a verbal run through from it, uh, just catch up with Vicky Siliano, who is very happy to talk about it, as I am. But uh, the small business white paper has been a really key uh, platform for the IPA. But I want to talk about the, in the white paper we talk about the economic importance of small business in Australia. And it's about drawing a connection between the situation we're finding economically in Australia and what can be done about it. So it's fair to say we have the small business focus because 75% of our members work in and with small business every day. We respect the fact that some members don't work in small business. Uh, but the vast majority of members do. So either working as, uh, as financial controllers or accountants in a small business or SME, or working in practice supporting uh, SMEs. Uh, just as, a, as an interesting sort of show of hands, would you, how many of you would categorise yourselves as being uh, small business focused in your work? That's a fairly ringing endorsement of, of the policy approach. Okay, so that's, and that's, that's consistent across the IPA in, in our view. So everything we do really does touch small business in some way. But I think that notion of 75% is really important. In Australia, we're facing the very real prospect, though, of a fall in our living standards. Now, I know a bit of the thrust of the presentation has been a little bit um, doom and gloom, but I want to paint a picture and then propose some solutions. So we know in Australia our productivity has been growing over the last 12, 15 years. Our prosperity as a country has grown. Australia is a pretty good place to live comparatively to, to other markets around the world. Uh, so our growth in living standards has increased uh, exponentially over the last uh, uh, decade and a half. But the Treasury forecasts actually see that, and the forecasts are that they taper off significantly. And that unless we do something about it, to unleash a more productive capability in, in the economy, we're at risk of those uh, living standards dropping away. To give you an idea, we all love our numbers. Um, the Australia's growth in, in our, our productivity, our, our labour force productivity, has been growing about 2%. Now that's pretty, pretty high for an economy like Australia. We've never had growth rates like that uh, in, in, in the country, even, well, since, certainly since uh, the Second World War. Uh, in order for Australia to maintain our growth in prosperity and living standards, we need productivity to be up over 2%. Now our productivity has been driven by terms of trade, you know, the mining boom and so forth. Again, that's softening. So the market, the economy is exposed. And the proposition we've put through the white paper is in order for Australia to maintain our living standards and growth in prosperity, we actually need to boost productivity of small business. The government's running out of levers Manufacturing is drying up in Australia. We actually need to unleash the productive capabilities of small business to grow the, uh, the levels of productivity across the economy. So the, the failure to lift productivity will have a direct impact on living standards of Australians. So it's not a, not a stretch to say if we get this wrong, there are dire consequences. And so we've put that proposition to government and to the opposition uh, and we're seeing some policy traction as well. It's our view that small business certainly holds the key and that really we must be exploring some of those options that we've put on the table. And I'll go through a few of those in some detail. We've launched the IPA Deakin University Research Partnership for, uh, for SMEs and it's been a really important move because everyone talks about small business. You know, you turn your TV on, uh, there's a business program on, there's a small business specialist talking about, um, about small business, probably has never run a small business, uh, and, and everyone's got a theory on small business. It's all based on um, instinct and gut instinct and gut feel. So we said, well, enough of the gut feel. What do we actually have to do uh, to build the evidence base? So if we're going to go and talk to government, we've got to have something to say and we've got to have it resourced with policy and with, with research. And so we formed this research partnership which has been immensely successful. Uh, and so we've drawn on academic resource from the UK and around the world, benchmarking to the OECD and other places. So that when we make a recommendation to government, they've got the confidence to know that it's actually been researched and it's proven. And so the idea behind this is when we speak through the white paper to government, we do so uh, with uh, credibility and the support of industry and importantly, uh, with evidence. 
We've, throughout the process last year, we spoke literally to hundreds of small businesses right across Australia. So we went through, we started the process, um, we had many of our partners actually uh, in, in the room were, were actually at the small business roundtable we facilitated in Canberra. Uh, we had the minister, the shadow minister, and, and uh, we had crossbench members, the ACCC, ASIC, ATO, Treasury and so forth. And so bringing everyone together in one hit to say, right, let's just stop all the fluff around small business. What is it that small business wants? So we came up with a draft policy statement. And then we said, well, it's no good just us coming up with this and having academics saying this is right. So let's actually push that out a bit further. And we took it on the road. We engaged with more than 550 small businesses across Australia. And we deliberately took the round table away from capital cities. So we went, you know, we had Darwin, we had Bunbury, and we had Albury and so forth. We went around the country to actually talk to small businesses. And they told us directly what some of the issues were. And in the white paper, we've captured many of those as uh, sort of vignettes uh, to, to prove some of the policy recommendations that we, we actually have. So it's a thoughtful approach to the policy, backed by evidence and real insight. Again, the first time in Australia that we've ever had a, a small business white paper, and I think it's quite an important uh, development. So here are the, a few of the, small, the white paper recommendations for those of you who haven't yet had a look. And I'll, I'll skip, uh, skip through these pretty promptly. We've advocated for a state-backed loan guarantee uh, scheme with a focus on capital investment and, and uh, market development. You know, trying to boost the activity in relation to small business. But the intention is to uh, equalise Australia in a sense. Australia is the only market in the developed world that doesn't have a government-backed loan guarantee scheme. So our view is we should have one. I think pleasingly, it uh, looks like it's advancing. Venture capital, you know, there's a lot of discussion around venture capital. We're proposing to pool VC funds uh, for SMEs developing new products and services. Again, I'm just going to skip through these because they are in the white paper and we can provide you a copy um, uh, by just having a chat afterwards. And it's on the website as well. A new approach to R&D policy, innovation policy, a huge focus of the new Turnbull government is innovation policy. Uh, so we've, had, we've already got irons in the fire with the, the new innovation minister Christopher Pine and the um, Assistant Minister Wyatt Roy. And so there's a lot of uh, movement in relation to innovation policy in Australia, which is great. I want to revamp education, noting the fact that one in six small businesses in Australia say that access to education skills is the greatest inhibitor. So that's more, almost 400,000 businesses constrained by a skills gap, which I think is a damning indictment on the education system in Australia, and it needs to be addressed. This, the reference there to STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths, having those uh, that framework embedded in accounting courses and programs and uh, certainly through primary and secondary school education as well is really what we're uh, talking about. We need to be talk encouraging more younger people through primary and secondary schools to think about small business as a pathway, uh, a legitimate pathway for their careers. We want government to get out of the way. Um, we want a, a, an EU style think small first approach. Um, those who have had experience in, the, in Europe would probably say that's probably the only thing we want to inherit from the EU. <laughs> um, but, uh, but this notion of driving regulation that is designed by thinking about the impact on small business first. And I think it's a really key, uh, key step. And also about the proportional application of regulation. So a risk-based approach uh, on, uh, on regulation as well. We've touched on fair work and competition policy. There's been a lot of movement on competition law as well, but we think the time has come to redress the, the imbalance in industrial relations uh, in Australia as well. Uh, it shouldn't be as difficult as it is for small businesses to navigate through the fair work laws and fair work processes. Many of the feedback uh, items we had from small businesses were that you know, they go through the process of going to the commission and as frivolous as a claim may be, uh, basically it's easy for the small business just to cut a check and settle rather than going through the process of a, uh, of a, of a, a claim through the Fair Work Commission. And that's just not right. Um, so we've uh, put some recommendations on the table there. Unsurprisingly, taxation is a focus. The government's got the tax uh, recommendations and white paper reform coming through the process as well. We want the extension of small business tax cuts, um, a longer term tax debate, but really about a simpler corporate structure. The US has a pretty good arrangement where you can apply the same, uh, effectively the same approach to a small business as you can to an incorporated entity. So we think there's some opportunities there. Extend a safe harbour provisions. Some of the members, uh, uh, small businesses we heard from up in Northern Territory said, you know, we're good people, we're honest, we do the right thing. 
just uh, if we make a mistake, we don't want the ATO crawling all over us. Um, so, you know, I think the words they used were, we want to get out of jail free card. And I said, we might not put that in the white paper, but um, uh, we, we, know the, we know where you're going. Uh, and, and also looking at the revenue definition uh, to update that to reflect actually what's changed. And, and the modelling we've suggested is that revenue should be around $3 million. Expert poli uh, sorry, export policy needs to be reviewed as well and that we should really have a priority list of trading partners for small business. So when free trade agreements are struck, small business is at the top of the tree as well. So all that leads towards the notion of productivity. So how do we create that environment for small business to become the most productive that it possibly can? About being smarter, faster and cheaper when it comes to advising uh, small businesses that you're working with. So how do you do that? So again, the thrust of the policy goes to that in, in looking at the pillars of productivity of financial capital, human capital, and innovation and technology. So it's using those three pillars of productivity to actually achieve a smarter, faster, cheaper uh, small business environment. The federal budget saw a huge step forward for small business, uh, uh, in excess of $5 billion support package. And I think that was a, a, a great achievement. Uh, many say it could have gone further. Uh, our challenge though is to maintain the rage when it comes to small business policy reform because what we want to avoid is a sense that, well, job done, small business uh, received its assistance package, uh, we'll move on to other priorities. We need to keep educating government and the opposition that resourcing small business and supporting it is really key for Australia's long-term productivity. To turn Australia into the best place in the world to start and run a small business. That is the overarching intention of what we're talking about. So until we've done that, we'll, we'll keep the pressure on. So then what's our collective challenge? It's, it's about turning ourselves from being the trusted advisor, that 9 out of 10 trusted advice model, to being you know, the trusted productivity advisor, the person that your clients come to to make their business more productive. And that's really what we're talking about through this process. You have that trust bestowed in you by your clients. They respect you. They want that service from you to grow and to prosper. But small business does need your support and they deserve it as well. The community deserves it because of the social impact we talked about a bit earlier. But you can't really do that alone. You need the support of a range of people from an intermediary point of view, sort of seeing you at the hub you know, as the conductor of the orchestra. But you need to take that, that message along and take your clients along with you on that journey and look at the various partners. So for example, at the conference here, we have assembled a panel of uh, partners and of, uh, of uh, sponsors and exhibitors with a desi you know, designed to support your practice, make your practice more productive. There is not one exhibitor out there that is not there to help you make your practice more productive. So I encourage you to engage them, talk to them about how they can help you and help your practice. And then you become that uh, trusted service provider as the centre of advice. So again, what we're trying to do is talk about being smarter, faster and cheaper to become more competitive and to prosper. And the white paper is there, I recommend it to you. Um, because I've, it's my view that, and our view that we are entering our most exciting phase since our federation as, as a country. Uh, there's never been a better time, I think, to be in the profession and certainly to be involved in providing that support to, to small businesses. And we will be able to make uh, Australia the best place in the world to start and run a small business. We need your support in that process as well. Again, the reference there is on the website, just for uh, publicaccountants.org.au forward slash white paper. Download a copy, give us your thoughts and your feedback. It's a continual process, so we'll be updating it as we go, but really interested to hear your thoughts in terms of that uh, process as well. Finally, this event finally is about you and about your, uh, your knowledge and your updating your knowledge. The, the accountant's commodity, is what people come to you for is your knowledge, but the value of your uh, knowledge is determined by the currency of it. So that's why the IPA has a relentless focus on being obviously practical, relevant and responsive. So when you've completed those cards, please provide them to one of the people in uh, black t-shirts, the IPA crew, so we can feed that into our planning process. Again, I really encourage you to engage in the Congress. I want to thank you for your support uh, in what's been a really exciting year as an organisation. We're just getting started as an organisation, which is key. Enjoy the Congress. I'm not quite sure what it is about IPA Congresses. We were talking about this the other night. Why is it that IPA Congresses have this buzz and it's sort of a really warm, fuzzy feel and it's, I don't think it's anything necessarily that we do as an organisation, it's about the people that come along to it and that's you. So I really encourage you to, to engage, engage with the partners and the sponsors and I really encourage you to have a great Congress. Thanks very much. Thank you.